<laughs> oh, broadcast is live. Okay. Oh, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? We can't see you, but you can see us. So we take that as a good thing. <laughs> so um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome my dear friends and colleagues, Matthew Rohde and Madeline Knutson. And uh, today they will be talking about transforming communities through the guitar. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, can't, can't see you guys, but it's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. It's so cool to be the first event in this festival. Um, before anything else, I want to thank, and I know uh, I speak for Madeline as well, I want to thank Adam for a tremendous job. I mean, this has been a... Hey, Matt. Yeah. I think somebody's, I think somebody's stream is on. Somebody's watching a stream right now, and it's... It's showing. Somebody stream? What do you mean? I think somebody's. Anyway, keep going. I think I still hear my voice. You hear your voice. Okay. Can I keep going? Is it, is it still yeah. a problem, Adam? Lucy says it's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, it's we're so glad to be able to kick off this festival. Thank you. Uh, we can't see you, but um, thank you for joining us and um, being a part of this. I, uh, Adam is a dear, dear, uh, three dears friend of mine, and I've seen up close and personal how much work has gone into this thing. So I just want to um, congratulate him really on just such a tremendous job of organizing this festival, which has been um, an uphill battle given the circumstances that we all know about this year, but um, it's, it's coming together just splendidly. So thank you and congratulations. Um, and just to echo Matt, um, yeah. again, thank you to Adam and, I, and thank you to the University of Rhode Island. I'm so honored to be able to speak to so many classical guitarists I know and admire and um, hear their playing all weekend. I'd also like to thank both Adam and Matt for bringing me into the Guitar Project because I haven't been here from the beginning, but for the last four years, three, three to four years, um, I've been so proud to be part of this work. Cool. Yeah. I mean, and one more quick word about the festival. It's also just so exciting to be participating in a festival with so many cool, diverse uh, musicians. Um, I, I love the, the, the reach of it. And it's not something you see very often in guitar festivals like this. So again, bravo. Um, and also thank you to Lucy Little and everyone uh, here at, uh, at, at Rhode Island. Um, at Yorba, it's made this possible because it, it takes a village for this kind of thing. And uh, I know there are a lot of people working behind the scenes. So um, congratulations and thank you. Um, the, uh, the, I guess the title of the talk is, the tra is Transforming Community Through Guitar. And I think the three of us would like to focus our talk on the work of Cathar Project. For those of you that might not be familiar with Cathar Project, it is an organization that um, Adam and I helped found along with Scott Borg, who also happens to be participating in the festival, um, an organization we founded about five years ago. And in a nutshell, the, uh, the work of the organization is dedicated towards providing classical guitar education for at-risk youth and children in, in neglected communities in the, in the United States and in Mexico. And um, we're going to go more in depth in a moment into, into the nitty gritty and the, the weeds of our work. But um, in broad strokes, we, um, we have long term, um, deep exposure, comprehensive music programs in um, Boston. We now have two um, in two different locations in Boston, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and in Mexico City. Um, so I guess this question, I'd like to structure this as maybe a loose kind of interview where we can just sort of ask each other questions. But before getting into Cathar Project, why, Madeline, Adam, why, why do we do this work to begin with? Where does the, the drive and the need 
um, come from? Well, Adam and Matt and I have talked about this a lot and we feel so, um, you know, the foundational experiences of our lives that have led us to where we are today are musical and really community based. You know, the teachers that have mentored us, the musicians that we have played with, the experiences we have had performing and feeling so lucky to have that kind of in-depth, long-term music training. Um, it's important, you know, without the cliche of saying, give back, it is important that we make sure that other youth have this opportunity and that we continue to kind of build, um, you know, the world of youth guitarists who become the performers we love, the teachers we love, and the teachers that mentor the next generation of students. I, I think that's been important to all three of us. I think um, for me, it's been really important uh, to provide a service that I was fortunate to have growing up. Uh, I didn't realize until, I mean, I was in my 20s that not everybody <laughs> gets a music education uh, in this world and that's unfortunate. And um, I think for years, um, the three of us separately and uh, now together um, believed in the power of the guitar, the, the magic of the guitar and its ability to bring us together um, and to heal. I think we are all seeing that, especially uh, we will see it this weekend, that, that, that its ability, its transformative ability to heal us, um, it does that for young people. And if you can imprint um, good values, human values, musical values at a really early age, um, it, it can have lasting effects um, that are both measurable and, and not measurable. And that's, I think that's very beautiful, so. Yeah, I absolutely echo that. I mean, um, I think the healing aspect is really important. And I think the guitar and music in general allows us to feel part of something much larger. I think this festival is, is uh, exhibit A of, of, of that, um, especially in times when we're, uh, we're forced to, to really withdraw in a lot of ways. Um, I also, whenever I think about this question, and I think about it pretty often, I, I think of an interview I read um, of Yo-Yo Ma several years back, and he made the point, I'm paraphrasing, that art and music fundamentally um, at its core is a service. And if as a musician you, uh, you embark on your work with that in mind, you're always going to end up on a good road and in the right direction. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that is a very important uh, point for me. So I think um, before, uh, before we start talking too much about Guitar Project, we'd just like to show you a quick video um, that is hot off the presses, literally. Um, this is a, a quick sampling, it's only two minutes long, of an online program we ran in Albuquerque. Al it, Albuquerque, of course, is where we have one of our longer term programs, but of course, um, classes have been forced online recently. So this will give you a taste of, um, taste of our work there. How does guitar make you feel? It makes me feel happy and good inside. <laughs> Song, 
during like quarantine, you get sort of bored. Playing guitar, I feel happy and challenged and sort of like excited. It makes me feel less alone. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I was my computer was reloading. Um, Cathara Project. Um, I briefly described it, um, outlined it earlier. It is a nonprofit um, that is about five years old, and its mission is to improve the lives and opportunities of children and youth through the classical guitar. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have. We currently run three comprehensive long-term uh, classical guitar programs for these kids that include group classes, private lessons, ensemble training, guest artists, field trips, the whole caboodle. Um, the idea is that we're providing them with uh, the opportunities that we, the three of us, as privileged young people in the US had, um, had in music as well. Uh, we serve over 130 students at this point uh, in Austin, Massachusetts, in, um, uh, in Mexico City, and then in an elementary school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And yeah, I don't, am I missing anything? And we have a brand new program in, um, in the Oak Square YMCA, which is also in Austin, or also in Austin. Austin. Yeah. very close to our other program, but that one just began this last last January. All right. Who, who are these clowns? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Who are these clowns? <laughs> um, at the moment, the, the leadership consists of a board of directors of five um, with that come from are drawn from as kind of diverse a swath of sectors as possible. Um, there are two directors, myself and uh, Adam, and Madeline is our program and development and also operations manager. And then we also are able to employ a number of uh, site-specific instructors in Albuquerque, in Mexico, and in Boston. So I guess that brings us to a total of uh, six um, staff employees and then uh, 11, including the board of directors. And here, again, I, on the lower right hand, I don't know who those clowns oh, are. Oh, gosh. Not <laughs> we sure do know how to have fun. You can kind of get a sense of. Um, uh, having not been uh, here from the very beginning of the organization, I guess I'm going to kick off the questions with um, what did Kithara Project look like in the beginning? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, um, it. Started out with some highfalutin numbers uh, in the millions. Uh, we, you know, we we all wanted to dream big, and we still do dream big. But if you guys, all of you out there, saw our spreadsheet with with uh, budget numbers, I mean, you would have thought we were managing uh, the federal government's budget. <laughs> I, I'm gonna find that that document and frame it and give it to you. Yeah. It, it included all the. Uh, the, the whistles and specialty items like jets and stuff like that. No, it didn't, but um, yeah, it was, a lot of it was blueprinting. A lot of it was trial and or error. Um, it was, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, they, we're not, we're not nonprofit. We weren't nonprofit directors at the time. And we were essentially having to open up, you know, nonprofits for dummies and, and establish uh, who we, who we were, who we wanted to be and and in our direction and, and defining our mission which has been scripted a million times i i think both um uh, well both adam scott and i um we had spent our lives learning about music and and refining our skills as musicians and i think none of us quite realized how complex and uh and difficult the work of actually creating a viable organization was. So as Adam said, we were 
literally Googling how to start a nonprofit. Um, we were, we were starting literally at zero and, and so it was a very slow curve at start at the start. And we, uh, as Adam said, we had a lot of really <laughs> overly aspirational numbers and dreams and we sort of slowly but surely had to, um, define a mission, um, which was and a board deceptively difficult and extremely important. We had to incorporate, we had to assemble a board of directors. Um, we didn't even know what a board of directors really quite did, I think, <laughs> starting off. Um, we had to file for 501c3 status from the IRS, which was a, a pain. We, there were so many little nuts and bolts that came into focus as we, um, as we learned more. Um, one of the one of the big challenges in the beginning, and it frankly remains a challenge, is are some of the big organizational decisions about our work. The mission is one thing that um, that determines the spirit and the general direction of a lot of our work. But um, we also had to. Uh, there was an ongoing debate um, between us between uh, whether to focus on specific sites and smaller number of smaller numbers of students, um, but in long-term programming or to focus on um, this idea of teaching artistry, which is a more sort of broad exposure, uh, playing for assemblies full of kids in schools and just hitting thousands and thousands of students, which also is a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to do. But um, especially when you're a young organization you, and you have a limited, uh, limited reach and li limited organizational capacity, you can't do everything. So, um, so we were really sort of uh, weighing the benefits and and cons of, of each of those um, different directions. Yeah, I think that, I mean, we also talked to, this was a great opportunity for us to create a think tank uh, among our colleagues, among other people who are in the nonprofit field and really get a sense of whether or not we were making the right decision. and. Uh, it came down, sustainable long-term programs uh, was preferable each time. And we also, you know, it w the point was made to us that doing the teaching artistry, which is super valuable, uh, one mentor of ours told us that it was in, in some ways like a tease. You're, you're, giving, you're showing them the magic and then you're not allowing them to learn and experience this magic for a long period of time. So you're sort of leaving them in, in the dust, so to speak. Um, so we, we thought that we would dedicate ourselves to uh, a, a growing, a smaller group of students and really help them uh, grow on the guitar from scratch. In thinking about our impact, there's kind of, um, you know, there's a quantitative numbers part and then kind of what is the more meaningful part, like the video that we saw earlier is, the uh, experience that kids have with music, the feelings they have about playing music and how they even just feel walking into class, knowing they waking up one day, knowing they have guitar that day. Uh, from the numbers, as Matt said, we have 130 students about this year who are ages six to 16 um, across four programs. Uh, the communities experience, you know, they get to have concerts. We even have, you know, we have annual parties. The kids are this year beginning having juried auction. I mean, jury, um, juries. <laughs> and um, we really considered the guitar to be a platform for cross-cultural exchange. Um, a lot of our students speak Spanish, both in the Mexico program and in the Albuquerque program. Uh, we like to have guest artists from many different styles and from, you know, backgrounds all across the world to really show guitar as something that unites us. All of these students receive this year round instruction tuition free. Um, most have the opportunity, if they, would, if they would like, they have the opportunity for private lessons, which usually the students who have been in the program longer take advantage of. Um, we're, we, give, we provide summer programming so that we try to have no gaps so that students can kind of keep their music education going year round. And um, just kind of giving them, we, they have access to guitar festivals. Um, they have, some of our students, I, I believe, are participating in this festival as well. Um, and we like to build the community of our teachers as well to make a ped pedagogical think tank. We're going to be working this upcoming year on a curriculum. So we really hope that our programs can fully 
you know, impact not just a student can play a song, but kind of as the title uh, suggests, like transform the community to be a like-minded music appreciating um, fun place to be. One of the projects that were, or one of the impacts we're most proud of and is very uh, up and coming is the project in Ugolito with the capital campaign. So Matt is gonna talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, Ugolito, by the way, is the name of the community that we work in in Mexico City. It is an informal settlement, um, which means that it was essentially settled 12 years ago without the necessarily the blessing of the municipality. Um, it's a very sort of pull itself by, up by its bootstraps um, sort of mentality that, 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 that drives the place. Uh, the community is built on top of a landfill um, of repository from rubble from the 1985 earthquake. So, it, um, and before, uh, before 12 years ago, it was, it was um, in the eastern part of the city. And we've worked there for going on five years now and maintain a great relationship with the community. And recently uh, I was called in by the leadership and I thought, oh no, what's gone wrong now? And it turned out they were so happy with, with the work and our partnership that they decided to, uh, to give us a piece of land so that we might build a music school. Um, so this, I, I don't know any other greater sort of symbol or, uh, or testament of, of, of our impact than, than, than an actual music school, um, spearheaded no less by the community itself. And we're just kind of uh, helping get it off, getting, getting it off the ground, but um, along for the ride. Anyway, this is Ugolito 12 years ago. So it really gives you a sense of, um, of what people started with. And this is Ugolito now. Um, it's really, it's changed quite a lot. Um, this is a community that, because it doesn't really have the blessing of the municipality, it doesn't have water. They capture their own rainwater um, and they, they take responsibility internally for almost all the major services. Um, here's another view of a, a, a volcano, um, not active, um, in the background, uh, one of the major landmarks of the area. And then here you can see one of the initial uh, conceptual renderings provided to us by an amazing team of architects that has uh, taken on the project pro bono. And the idea here is that um, I'm going to just nerd out ever so briefly because we're all, I think all three of us are so excited about this. Point. <laughs> but the, the archway is kind of an homage. Let's just leave it at that for now, that image. Um, the archway is an homage to a traditional historical Mex Mexican motif of uh, the so-called open chapel. Um, and the skin of the building is, uh, will be built with donated and found rubble, um, which is a chance to let everybody sort of participate in the construction of the building and is also sort of an homage to the, uh, to the sites history as, as a repository for all the rubble from the earthquake. Um, and you can see here, there's a, a ground floor that opens up rather dramatically onto the street. So the, the idea is that Lynn is at once a speaker onto the street and also this really inviting space um, that invites people from the community, um, whether or not they're students, into this uh, musical sanctuary. And then there's a, an upper level um, that's kind of gradated with stairs and is a slightly more intimate and um, open air uh, classroom and recital space that uh, that lies on the direct axis um, between the two major landmarks, um, which are both these sort of red hilly volcanoes, very striking, and they're framed in the arch um, on both sides. So it's a, uh, I think, a very, very sensitive and um, a wonderful design that that engages that has the potential to really uh, engage the community even even more deeply. And I, when we think about impact, I'm just looking at this, um, you know, at this sketch for what we hope to be breaking ground in a couple of months. Is that 
remembering that five five years ago, Matt was saying he was going to go out to this community and, you know, they wanted to have a guitar program and he wanted to make something something work. And it really just starts with some lessons, get, you know, a couple of group classes. Adam went down, right, for the original workshop and they saw the community really wanting guitar there and just kind of set up a long-term shop. And then, of course, the back end of fundraising, which I'll talk about more later. And all of that kind of brings us right to this point where we have we're halfway. Uh, we have twenty-one thousand dollars raised of the forty thousand dollars that we need uh, to finish the building and um, some additional program funding. Hey, hey, Matt, can you tell that yeah. story about the uh, survey that was taken in in Ugolito? I think that's such oh. a profound story to share. Right. This is this is sort of the origin story, um, which I'm asked about rather frequently of the program. How did we end up in such a uh, Let's just say it's not a it's not a community that lies on most on the pathways of most visitors like like me. Um, we were in the process of founding the uh, the organization. This is again five years ago, and and we were very interested in doing work in Latin America and in Mexico specifically. And um, and I was I was talking to a friend down here and telling her about our plans and. Um, she put me in touch with a social worker who later turned out work here. And this social worker had recently conducted an interview in the community um, asking, or a, or a survey rather, asking people what service or what initiative they would most like to see for, uh, for their community. And there was a whole list of options that included, I think, uh, computer skills, um, I think sports, I think, um, probably mental health, I whole list of options. The point is um, the most popular option was music. So um, the demand came from within. And when I learned about this, when we learned about this, we just said, oh my gosh, um, like let's, let's get there and let's figure something out. So um, it's, been, it's been a really enthusiastic and proactive collaboration from both ends from the very, very beginning. And I think that's been very, very important to our success. So, um, as Adam, you know, has mentioned in our introduction and is on the forefront of all of our minds, it's been an unusual time um, for, for lessons, for music, for everything. And we were, of course, kind of floored and wondering how we were gonna stay in our students' lives and how we were gonna make this work. Um, in our students in Mexico, unfortunately, we don't have very reliable internet access with them. So some of our programs have had to go on a pause, but yet some of our programs have been able to really flourish um, online. You saw the video from the Albuquerque students this summer, and here's a photo of one of the students on Zoom with um, his teacher, Genevieve Leitner. So we found that students were really excited to continue the summer on Zoom. They're still, you know, we're prepared to do online and all of our programs in the fall if need be. Um, but another idea that we had kind of thinking, what can we do? What, what can you do when what you normally do is no longer possible? Um, Adam and Matt, we thought we would do a virtual guitar competition. And I, I was actually particularly hesitant, um, not sure that we would get the numbers and that people would sign up. But we are really, really excited to make it an annual event now that we see we got over 50 um, applicants and everyone received detailed feedback, really like two pages of feedback from our internationally renowned judges. We gave out cash prizes. We had partnerships with um, classical guitar, acoustic guitar magazine, and people received subscriptions and copies of the Sharon Isman classical guitar answer book. Um, if, if anyone has time or interest on our website, we have all of our student winners listed with permission from their parents to have their videos shown. We were, um, you know, we have kids from first grade to we had high school students, one of whom wrote their own compositions, which were really, really impressive. Um, and it was something that we really weren't sure people were going to be interested in because it wasn't what we normally did. And we found the parents were thrilled, kids really loved it. And it's it's kind of going into our list of every year things to do, even though we never would have thought of it um, if not for this strange thing. It, it was always so, so friendly too. I, I, I felt like uh, from the onset, when we engaged the uh, judges, they were so eager to give feedback. I think, again, like in this time of disengagement, people are looking to like share their feelings and perspectives. And uh, 
each judge was just so gracious with their feedback. I mean, <laughs> pages sometimes of feedback to uh, students. So I think everybody, regardless of walking away with like a physical prize, they, they walked away with more valuable feedback that they can use going forward. All right, that's the fun part. Um, so Cathar Project, I came on three or four years ago, which I can't seem to remember, maybe three. Um, mostly with a background in classical guitar and education specifically as a Suzuki teacher, but also having just finished a master's in management um, and having been the managing director of some music here in New York. So I had to ask for um, fundraising and we've done budget uh, over the past several years. And I will say starting a guitar program, fundraising is a constant moving target. There's no point where you receive being like, or at least it has not been for us, being like funded. Um, you know, every year we have to do a mix of grants. We have fundraising events, which you have some pictures up here. The one on, um, with Genevieve is in Albuquerque and then in Boston with Carl Straussner. Um, you know, we have these events where we do silent auctions. We sell tickets. We try to get donations for um, and discounts for food and drinks, um, have volunteer performers. Um, it's it's a lot of work to do the fundraising, but it's we are really proud and and often sometimes kind of uh, shocked that we're able to fundraise our entire budget. Um, in 2018, we raised over ninety six thousand dollars, and in 2019, ninety eight thousand um, dollars. That basically we adopted instead of doing one fundraising event once a year, we did kind of a year round. Uh, we do a guitar auction that's in the fall, and then we do an end of year appeal that's online at the end of the year. We added spring events um, and house concerts where Adam and Matt would play at a donor's home and they invite some of their close friends and we kind of build our networks that way. Um, last year, of course, our budget was originally projected to be 120, but I think because of the shutdown in COVID, we did about half of that, but we're still projecting um, you know, next year to be right around raising $120,000 again. A big part of fundraising is partnerships. Uh, we could not, I don't know what this little link is here, um, <laughs> is partnerships. So here are some of our partners. We have received grants from the Diderio Foundation and Charles View Inc. for years. Um, one of the things I will say about grant writing and grant funding is it takes patience. Um, there are very few times where you actually write a random grant for someone you've never spoken to and you get that funding. Uh, it has happened, and, and our success story with that is um, Harvard Alston Partnership Fund, which was kind of a surprise grant we got last year, which is very exciting. We also consider our partners to be um, the sites that we work with, because really, like about, via Vista Elementary School, the Oak Square YMCA, Charles View Fiorentina Community Center. Um, these programs would not work without, they, they commit staff resources, they commit space, they do a lot of recruiting for us and help us get the students. Um, so we consider them really full partners in the programming as well. Uh, and then there's kind of uh, event sponsors. Kenny Hill Guitars has been a huge, um, he's on our board and he has been a huge help. We have an annual guitar auction where we auction off a guitar every October coming up. Um, and for the competition, we had Augustine String sponsor. So a lot of these partnerships, you have to you have to be a little kind of brave and just call people up and say, here's what I'm doing. You know, even when we buy guitars, we call people up and say, here's here's what we're doing. Here's our students. You know, do you have any interest in in kind of coming on board and helping us? And it's really, you know, for all the calls that you get that people say no, um, a lot of people want to help. And that's one of the things about nonprofit fundraising and kind of program support is you have to just be constantly looking for other people who have the same goals and ideals and who are happy to make this work, uh, which which is what's been most challenging and also kind of the best part for me. Yeah, before we go in there, you know, another thing, I don't think in a million years, I thought, I think I could speak for uh, Matt and perhaps Madeline, in a million years that I think I would be fundraising for an organization like that. It's an it's an awkward uh, thing to sort of wrap your mind around is that that the lifeline of an organization is based on the altruism of other people and and you asking them to participate in, in this uh, 
and this organization. Um, and it's, I, I think what we had, we learned quickly is that you can't be bashful. Um, it, it's not much unlike being a performing artist. You can't be bashful when you walk up on stage. Um, you express yourself. It's, it's something you believe in strongly and passionately about, and you go up there and deliver the best thing you can and people uh, will hopefully believe in it. And I think, um, I think one of the challenges for any organization is transcending uh, the organization to be just about the members of the organization to a cause. So going from it being about Matt, Madeline and I to being about uh, guitar education and improving the lives of, of young people and I think as soon as we start as soon as we started identifying the cause, people start transitioning away from identifying our faces with it, but identifying with the faces of the of the students. And um, yeah, and and the fundraising is yeah, it's a lot of nuts and bolts. It's it's a it's a constant um, Tet offensive. Uh, we're we're always out in the field uh, trying to look for new opportunities, but it's all. Uh, for the betterment and improvement of, of the organization. Um, and we try to do it as, as selflessly as, po as possible. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, just to piggyback a little bit on this idea of not being bashful, if one has a really well-articulated mission and a lot of passion about a cause that can get other people excited, it's, people are excited to be a part of it. and. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to feel like you're always asking people favors if, um, if it's something that they can, they can, they can get excited about. Um, I think this is a good segue, uh, to one of our last slides. So Adam, Madeline, I'm a recent master's grad, let's say, or, you know, a person of any age. Uh, who wants to get into nonprofit work, maybe wants to start a nonprofit, maybe just do more of this kind of work. What do you, what do you recommend? What do you advise me? Madeline, you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> you know, I, I think number one, um, I think it starts uh, from the heart and uh, the passion and the love. Uh, you have to ask yourself some really hard questions, whether or not you have the persistence and the resilience to continue day in and day uh, day day in and day out uh, to really dedicate yourself um, to the en enrichment of other people <laughs> other than yourself, and um, and then you have to go from ask that question and then go to how are you going to do that, like wh how are you going to answer that? Well, what's what's missing and, and what void are you uh, filling. And um, those are questions you will ask yourself throughout. Um, and you have to make important choices. Again, m music in general, it's a choice. We make a choice to, 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 um, to play the guitar, to learn, uh, to teach, to perform. Um, and you have to uh, be ready to dedicate yourself wholeheartedly uh, to the greater good. Um, you are latching on to the community um, and uh, you are embracing them wholeheartedly. And I, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's philosophical at first. Um, it's something very personal, it's psychological, but then uh, getting to uh, the nuts and bolts um, and trying to whittle it down uh, to a mission. Yeah, I guess, you know, my first advice would be to figure out um, for who you're going to do this for. Um, you know, like Adam was saying, where where is the work needed? Where do you know there are students without access? Where do you want to work? Um, and then with who? Because I will say it's, it's very hard. I couldn't imagine any of us um, doing this on our own um, or any of our teachers doing it on our own. Um, it's really uh, the, organ the word organization and everything is very we are totally kind of a unit and I can't imagine us doing it separately. Um, it is also possible, I will say, to make other structures work. If you want to start a guitar program, but you don't want to start a full nonprofit and get incorporated, there are organizations, I believe Fractured Atlas is one that can kind of 
um, be your 501c3 backer kind of so that they you're able to accept donations, which are great for smaller projects if you're not sure you're ready to like take the jump into really incorporating. I'll also yeah. say that there yeah. Are yeah, there is certainly um, a lot of hard work, but it is also possible that we've seen to, to create work for musicians um, through through this kind of program. I mean, we're very proud to be able to employ teachers, um, you know, and to try to keep building those positions and bring more people into the organization. It's certainly, as Adam said, not easy, but um, but over time, starting small and having the right team with you, um, you can kind of create both the need and, um, you know, and the supply of really quality music education. Yeah, I think that's all wonderful. And I guess the only thing I would add or emphasize is that um, while it is certainly possible and okay to make a dignified living in nonprofit work, and I, I think we all believe in dispelling the myth that nonprofit work always has to be voluntary or something like that, um, it's also very important to keep in mind from the very start that if the idea is about creating financial benefit, first and foremost, it's gonna fail. It has to, you, you have to, um, to identify the mission and let that guide all of your work. And if you do that well and correctly, then, then I, you have a chance at success. And if not, it's just, there's just no way. People see through, funders see, see through that. Um, everyone does. So, so really um, trust in the value of your, of your mission and, and let that drive your work. And also and, and something I would say to a lot of musicians who are interested in this kind of work is that it's, it's a lot of administrative, a lot of fundraising, a lot of non-musical work that doesn't exactly feel glamorous and be prepared for that. Um, it's worth it, but um, there's, a, there's a very steep learning curve that, um, that, that's necessary and, um, and just be ready to take on this, this new kind of work that, that uh, most musicians are not trained to do. And just to and add- also get a good accountant. Oh my gosh. And also to add to that, one of the things that I think is is really fun too is that you know most of our donors and people who are interested in our organization are also lovers of music and appreciators of music, and they can be um, you know hobbyists or they can be retired professionals or they can be um, you know in a completely different profession. I'm I'm actually moving away from music as a full time career, and I'm in law right now, and I see so many so many people have a passion for music. You know, lawyers and getting them a board member. We have a doctor on the board. We have a lawyer on the board. They're all um, real appreciators of the arts and they want a way to be involved with music. And this also, in, in addition to giving the students a way to have a real lifelong involvement with music, we also feel that way with our supporters. That is pretty much yeah, all. So, okay. oh, you want to go? I, that go is pretty much all we have planned. We have um, our website is katharaproject.org. You can email us either through Adam or we also have info at katharaproject.org. I think we have a couple of questions from viewers, which we are going to pull up now and um, answer for you guys. I, I don't, before we answer the questions, I would also like to say that um, the three of us are very accessible and we love to support other people in this work however we can. So even if you don't have any questions immediately, please feel free to get in touch with us. Just check in with an email, an email um, to bounce ideas off us or, or, or anything else. Um, we, we love to be able to support other, other people with uh, similar spirits. All right. Victor Main, I'll read the question for you guys. In retrospect, hey, would Victor. you say it is better to dream big, shoot for the stars, land on the moon philosophy? Or would you have been more conservative if you were starting out now, knowing what you know now? Um, well, I'm just gonna say this from someone coming into the organization. I really, it really helped me to know what Adam and Matt wanted to do. You know, I, I came in and they definitely, they still say they're gonna frame for me that first budget, which is apparently incredibly unrealistic, but, um, the, the dreaming big is not bad. Um, 
it's definitely something that gives you the big motivation. And, you know, we still have a list of projects that is way longer than we will do this year or next year, even probably the following year. And I don't know, I certainly don't wish that they had less of that. I, I think it's important. Um, I mean, every organization has its limitations. And uh, at the same time, I think it's important to have a, a vision as opposed to a mission. So a mission is, is, the, is the how. It's, well, let me start with the vision. A vision is the what and of an, or, of the, of an organization's work. Um, and it's what do we want to achieve, I'll say, in a perfect world is put a guitar in every kid's hands. And that sort of vision, I mean, are we going to put a guitar in every kid's hands in the world? No, I don't think so. But that's the sort of language that really gets people excited. Um, and at the same time, we have the mission, which is more the how. It's how do we actually see that vision through? And that's why we have these guitar programs and we, we work with kids you know, once a week in these communities. Um, so I think it's very important as a young organization or an organization of any age to have that, that, that aspirational vision that, that may always be aspirational, but really sort of guides the direction um, in big, broad strokes of your work. I will, I will temper what I said by saying that I am always kind of the budget. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit the realist of the budget, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> she reels us in all the time. <laughs> Matt and I are just like on the walls going crazy and, and she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We yeah, gotta she's settle like, down. She's like a fly fisherman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to have the dreams, but it's also important kind of not take huge risks. I mean, one of the ways that we are able to adjust and be agile as an organization is we don't have a lot of financial commitments beyond, you know, we don't have leased space yet. We don't have, you know, we pay teacher salaries. And if something happens, like COVID happens, we have the ability to kind of flex schedules and move things around so that we don't have so many commitments mm -hmm. that, you know, we're completely knocked out. So it's, it's a, it's realistic from the budget perspective, but big dreaming from the mission perspective, I would say. I think it's important to assemble a team that where there's checks and balances. I mean, I think what uh, Matt and I are saying is that the three of us and the and the teaching artists as well. I mean, we all hold each other accountable, um, and so we all have the opportunity to dream big, and then we have each other to be like, "Whoa, that sounds great, but we need to try this." And um, I think that's great. I think that's assembling an, a functioning organization with a variety of people is so important from the board of trustees to the teaching artists, to the uh, organizational members. It's really, really important. Um, and we've been lucky as well. I mean, the, the, the teaching artists that we choose, they're, they're charismatic people and we really rely on them to deliver a, a first class um, education to the kids. And we allow them to, to dream big as well, do what they see is most effective. And we trust that. And that's what we look in. We look for uh, revolutionary teachers, people who are going to make a difference from the moment they step into the classroom. Are we ready for the next question? Yeah. Oh, Cher Balcom. Hey, thanks so much for the, uh, the question. Are University of Rhode Island students involved in Cathar Project? To what extent can guitar students be involved? Um, so great question. Um, at the moment, um, I, I have peripherally involved University of Rhode Island students in Cathar Project. So um, I've, I've had a student visit the Massachusetts, the Boston-based program. But there's, again, there's always going to be something on the horizon that we have to work on. Partnerships are constantly being built. Um, and, you know, the partnership between academic institution and Cathar Project is, is for sure on the horizon. In fact, it, it, you know, we might even look at uh, connecting UMass Boston uh, with Cathar Project. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly endless. So the, I guess the answer, the short answer is, yes, I have done it. We want to do it more in the future. We've had, and we've also had tons of volunteers, young students as, uh, as, um, as young as 15, 16, going into volunteer um, and helping her out around the class. You, you, it's not just about being like a master teacher. You also have to, to, to organize a classroom. And it's tough when you have uh, 10 students in a, in, a, uh, in a single classroom. So you have to really look to your volunteers to help um, organize the class. 
Yeah, I will say we have a really wonderful volunteer program um, in Albuquerque that I think we'd love to get some more of that going in um, Boston as well. In Albuquerque, our main teacher there, Genevieve Leitner, teaches at, gosh, what, what is the school called, Matt? It's called Albuquerque Academy and it's, a, Academy. it's a, a prep school. And she has, you know, high school guitar players there who are very seriously studying guitar and they have become regular classroom helpers at the Via Vista Elementary School program, tuning, helping practice, taking kids onto the side and practicing with them. Um, I think we were, we loved how that worked. Uh, we'd love to have more of that going, like Adam said, in our other program. Absolutely. And it also, it, it, it validates our work to know that people want to contribute, that they want to donate, they want to give their time to this cause. Um, it, it, it makes us feel good. So I, I think it's, it's very symbiotic. I mean, the more that we give back to the community, the more they're going to give to us. So that, that's really wonderful. Do we have, I think we have another question. I, um, oh, hey Nick. <laughs> hey Nick. Uh, um, can you all can you all speak for a moment on curriculum you are developing? Great question. Yeah. So we are on the we are very close to hearing about a grant that we will have received to develop this curriculum. It's a project we've been wanting to do for several years, and we also think this is the right time, being that we may be having fewer classroom hours this fall. Um, all of our teachers, uh, you know, are experienced and they work towards goals to performance, um, you know, performance yeah. twice a year. We'd really love to see some more solidified technical goals for students after the first year in the first semester and also kind of have teachers. It's going to be a really collaborative um, curriculum. We're planning on soliciting a lot of input and we'd really like to have the teachers have more of a tool to use when they're looking for a performance piece for a student who's been playing for three months or when they're, you know, the student is at the end of their first year and they're looking for repertoire, they're looking for ideas for group class activities. Um, so Adam and Matt probably have plenty to add. No, I mean, I, I was only going to say yeah, that, I, I mean, at first, I think we relied on, again, our teachers to be, to spearhead the <laughs> curricular spirit in the classroom. But I think we're going to have our hand. I, th I know we're going to have our hand at creating a formal curriculum because it'll give us a way to track our students uh, over a, a short and long period of time and also create a guitar think tank, allow people not only in the, the Cathara family uh, to create a trajectory for our students, but also reach out to the, the greater guitar community and ask them, Hey, what are the ba best practices? What do you recommend? Like what's, what, what should we do here? So it's, it is a guitar think tank in, in many ways. And I'm, I'm excited to, to create that. Um, yeah. It's a, you know, it's a community within a community. It will also help us create common points of reference for our students across programs. Um, one, one thing we really want to uh, support and, and, and help push along is this idea of, of cross, cross program, cross, cross cultural uh, collaboration between the students. And so, if kids are learning the same piece or the same chamber work, um, it's just one more, one more point where they can meet. Is okay. So the question is: is only for guitar? Um, at, at the moment, at the moment, yes, our focus is the classical guitar. That's, um, that's our, our first love. And, and uh, while I think it would be amazing to have uh, a full orchestra in our programs, I think that's, that's beyond our scope. And, and it's also beyond our area of expertise. And, I will say that and so we, are... we would like to keep, keep our work, for now at least, defined, defined uh, by the guitar. We do know a lot of other wonderful. Oh, sorry. We do know a lot of other wonderful organizations, though, that are working in other instruments. Um, I think if we were going to do a project with chamber music or with other instruments, we would probably look at some sort of a fun collaborative partnership with um, with you know teachers who are really experts in their area and doing similar work, which of which there are many, really. Totally, guys. I, I actually have a question that I'd like to throw out there, if you don't mind. 
Does that sound good? Oh, did, were, were our voices crossing? Um, so anyway, okay. so what's on the horizon for Kathara Project? Like what, what, you know, we were talking about dreams and what we, where we envision the organization uh, to be. What's on the horizon for us? What are we looking forward to short term and long term? Well, short term, do you mind if I start, Madeline? No, go for it. Short term, me personally, I am just over the moon excited about this new building and I want to see it through. I want to break ground and, and cut the ribbon within the next nine months. We're very close to a design and it's so close I can take it. So I think that'll be a big boost for the organization, a big boost for the students uh, and, and for the cause. Um, short term is also complicated because we're still in the COVID swamp. Um, and we're still sort of all collectively navigating our ways forward in this and and we have to keep on adapting to this kind of tricky reality. Uh, so I think short term, we're also going to be looking for more sort of online um, opportunities. The competition was a big success. Genevieve's programming in Albuquerque, um, as well as some of our online work in Boston has been a big success. Um, it's been a little harder in Mexico um, because not all of the kids have reliable Internet access, but um, we're going to keep on doing the best we can. Um, we are also short term. I, one thing we haven't mentioned is the Cathar project has recently partnered with a an elementary, well, an elementary and no elementary school in Detroit um, called the Holy Redeemer School. And we are um, at the moment not quite starting a full blown program there, but um, We've been visiting a number of times a year, doing more of this short-term teaching artistry sort of work that we uh, alluded to in the very beginning and are consulting with them to start for them to start a guitar program of their own, which we um, hopefully will be um, more deeply involved with in the future. So we are looking to um, some sort of as of yet to be defined expansion of our work in, um, uh, in Detroit and, and hopefully other sites as well. Madeline, you wanna go? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I echo all of Matt's thoughts. I think it's uh, our expansion into the Oak Square YMCA is really exciting and is still kind of in its, um, you know, early formative stages. We do have classes there, but um, once we create the curriculum, the idea would be we'd be starting several more beginner classes there in the spring, which would be great. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to expand and bring um, you bring more people into the organization, being able, you know, having a second teacher in Albuquerque, um, having more people involved on the administrative side, which we're hoping the curriculum um, will give us that opportunity as well. Uh, oh, one, one thing that I don't think has been mentioned is, and which I think is more of a midterm goal, is I just, I dream and, and just, I am dying to be able to assemble an international youth guitar orchestra. I want, I mean, our students are already in touch. They've been in touch via pen pal, via video conference, and the curriculum will hopefully connect them. But I want them to get together in person and you know, shake each other's hands and play together face to face. So, yeah, you know, obviously now is not the time for that, but as soon as it's possible, um, that's, a, that's an important goal of mine. I think all of ours. I, I totally echo that. I, I, I was gonna say, in terms of um, cultural exchange, that's on the horizon, the immediate horizon is, and you know, something that we can do during this time, we've got this, this in this virtual age, we can put together a virtual guitar orchestra. So nobody will have to leave their country or state, they, we can do it from our home. But I think definitely in the near term, get these, these kids together playing in an international guitar orchestra. It would be a thrill, it gives me the goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think, d d any more questions? Uh, I don't think I see any more questions. Um, Madeline, Matthew, thank you so much for lecturing on uh, changing the world uh, through the guitar, creating community. It's It's been a real <laughs> pleasure to have both of you um, and talk oh. about Cathar Project. It's, it's really great. It's been a, a lifeline for all of us um, and, and really special. Thank you well, so much. Thank you for all your uh, for all your tremendous work on this festival and 
and get our budget as well. Um, it's it's really phenomenal, and I'm excited to to see the other the other artists. Yeah. I'm excited to see the students, the I mean the concerts, everything. So anyone who's watching now, just drink it up, watch it all. It's going to be great. It does come in a drink form. We've got the <laughs> University of Rhode Island uh, Sprite can. Yeah, um, and you get a free mug as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. No, I, I really I. I appreciate it so much, guys. And, and that's right. We've got an entire day ahead of us. Um, you guys can grab some lunch, grab a sandwich, coffee, tea, whatever, a steak, eggs, um, and uh, come back at one o'clock uh, for a wonderful uh, lecture by Patricia Price, who is a music, music consultant. She's the managing director of HVA Consultancy, and she'll be giving us a lecture on making a career, sustaining a career, branding yourself, all the, the nitty gritty things, it's gonna be uh, really interesting. So I, I invite you all to uh, join us at one o'clock. Then uh, Elliot Fisk and myself will be giving masterclasses this afternoon. And then this evening, don't miss out on an opportunity to hear Redmond O'Toole on the Brahms guitar and uh, blues guitarist, Corey Harris, they're gonna give a show this evening at 7.30, 7.15, virtual doors open, RSVP, it's free, it's all yours. And then this evening, we've got uh, Presidential Davis Lockie, <laughs> DV, that's what we call him, that's like that. Uh, Dave will be giving a wonderful performance this evening uh, as well, it should be a wild trip. So um, I'm not gonna give away any more, but you know where to go to RSVP, um, it's here for you. Thank you guys again for the lecture and uh, we'll see you around. All right, guys.